I'm Elizabeth Esty for the Emergency Medical Minute. We're excited to present our new limited series, Epidemic Meets Pandemic, in which we investigate how the nation's opioid epidemic has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the course of this series, we'll hear from a harm reductionist, an addiction medicine physician, a Denver police narcotics sergeant, and two people currently in recovery. Unfortunately, the opioid epidemic and the COVID-19 pandemic are likely not going anywhere soon. The Emergency Medical Minute remains committed to providing education to help combat these health crises. In this episode, we speak with Sergeant Lax Jorge with the Denver Police Narcotics Unit to gain insight into how drug trafficking has been impacted by COVID. We'll also discuss law enforcement's role in the recovery process and touch on social issues currently afflicting the country. We're so pleased to have Sergeant Lex Jorge of the Denver Police Department's District 1 Narcotics Division with us today to talk about the impact of COVID on narcotics policing. We so appreciate your taking a moment to speak with us at what has to be a challenging, busy time for you. I wonder, could you introduce yourself and tell us how you came to law enforcement and what your path to working in narcotics was? Absolutely, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. I was originally born and raised in Queens, New York. I moved to Denver to become a police officer. I was in graduate school at the University of Iowa in 2001 when 9-11 happened. And I was a theater major at the time. And 9-11 really steered me on a path towards law enforcement. Really, that just that desire to do more and to give back to uh, to my country, my community. And going into narcotics and specifically into plain clothes or undercover work, my background's in theater. So uh, it was a very natural progression for me. Uh, it was really just a matter of raising the stakes and really living in a character's shoes towards achieving a goal. And in this goal, it it just happens to be public safety. Uh, I've been a police officer in Denver, and the only place I've been a police officer, so I've been a police officer for 14 years and change now. And I've worked narcotics, I've worked gang unit, I've worked impact teams, street crime, going all the way back to just being a patrolman. And I've really enjoyed doing this, and I've enjoyed supporting the people of Denver and keeping this community safe. Uh, they've accepted me as an adopted son of the city, and I'm very grateful for the city. So that's where I stand. That's my basic resume. That's an amazing story, the pivot from theater to undercover. And I know we want to hear about COVID and the impact of COVID on narcotics policing, but I can't not ask, what are some of the roles you've played as an undercover narcotics officer? Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that are lucky enough to speak two languages. So I've gotten to uh, buy narcotics, I've bought guns, and I've uh, secured prostitution deals and a myriad out of other things in both English and Spanish. have gotten to do so all over the city and for a lot of different units. Uh, it's really too varied to put out there in terms of the, the specific individuals. And at the same time, I think there's a, a level of discretion that I've got to keep there too. I'm not going to give away too many of my secrets. Um, I'll, I'll probably uh, willingly give more of the roles I played on stage than the roles I played on the street. Awesome. Can I ask, though, cutting to the chase, how often have you failed in your acting endeavors? How often has somebody identified you as an undercover cop? People try, and that's not just for for me uh, in an undercover capacity, but for just about every deal that's done, either narcotics-wise or prostitution-wise, you're going to be asked if you're a cop. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's just the nature of the game, getting around that and, and getting them to believe that you're not is really the challenge. So have I gotten, quote unquote, gotten made? Yes, I've, I've gotten made before. Very, very rare that I have. And now that I'm in a supervisory position, I don't do as much of the undercover work. I supervise more of it, make sure my detectives and my officers are doing their job to the best of their ability and doing so safely for both themselves, the community, and the suspects. And we do, we get made. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, and there's nothing fun about it. You don't want to get made when the stakes are really, really high. When you're in the middle of a gun deal or a large-scale dope deal, the last thing you want is to get made. That can get really bad really quick. And we we avoid that, (laughs) to say the least. And we also have a lot of safety measures in place. But that's a tough one. It's something that we, we all wrestle with in this business. 
Well, I'll certainly buy your book when you're retired and ready to spill all those <laughs> secrets and tips and stories. Well, hopefully I'll get someone, maybe you, you can help me write it. I would love to ghostwrite your book. Yes, it's a deal. Excellent. <laughs> you start taking notes, though. you got to write this stuff down. Oh, um, absolutely. So to get, back, to get back to COVID, tell us before COVID hit, I don't know much about police work. I'll just be honest with you. What was a typical day in your life like? Really interesting how this worked out. The pandemic really hit home for all of us kind of right around the middle of March. Um, I want to say March 11th, 12th and 13th, I, I took a road trip with uh, some family and we had a great time. And by the time we got back, it was time to put our masks on and we couldn't leave the house. Hmm. Um, so before that, we had a really, really major development in Colorado in terms of narcotics enforcement. We had our changes to the, the Uniform Controlled Substances Act of 2013. So back in 2013, we started changing our scale of how we charged people for narcotics crimes. And we said, you know what, the, the idea of taking a user, someone that is suffering from substance use disorder and treating them with jail as a felony all the time, really didn't make too much sense. This is not my quote, but I've used it many, many times over the years. Treating substance use disorder with jail is like treating pneumonia with Robitussin. We're treating the symptom. We're not treating the actual disease. Mm -hmm. So we made quite a few changes through the legal process. And we, on March 1st of this year, anything under four grams of most controlled substances, with the exception of, pretty much the exception is, the date rate drug, G GHB. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, everything is now a drug misdemeanor. And once we get over four grams or we can articulate that this person is not a user, it's a dealer that's trying to poison our, our community, mm -hmm. then we step it up to a felony and we charge accordingly. And I think it's, it was a huge step for the state. It was a huge step in terms of reducing our social harms that we're seeing out on the street. But it was a huge adjustment as well for narcotics enforcement and particularly a lot of narcotics investigators, some of which have been focused on charging as a felony for 20, 25 years. I have one in my unit that has been working for 30 years and this has been his focus and it all kind of got flipped on him. Mm -hmm. um, and as you well know, as we as we age, we don't always accept change as readily <laughs> and we're not always as easy as easily adaptable. So our, my average day was really coming into work, getting our casework sorted out early on in the day. So the cases that were brought in by our uniformed guys overnight, if they made narcotics arrests, that type of thing, and we would go through the cases, we would supplement the case with uh, the investigative end and see where it's going, how we're going to charge this individual, and then that would get sent off to the district attorney's office. From there, we uh, consider it getting to go out and play. We go out to the community, we take on different projects, a uh, huge one that we did a couple of years ago, that was my first big one with this unit, was uh, the Spear Boulevard corridor from, right, with Colfax being the kind of ground zero, which is a stretch along the Cherry Creek Trail here in Denver that had, at the time, a, a huge, huge uh, heroin epidemic really just right underneath our feet and in the creek bed area, and dealing was out of control, the use was out of control, the garbage, um, needles, uh, sharps were everywhere until we put in a needle uh, sharps container. And it really, it was terrible. Through undercover work, through actually two or three months of both enforcement and court for individuals with substance use disorder and getting them, some people, the ones who would accept it, the help they needed, we were able to really take that problem down to uh, almost nil, to where we're getting zero complaints now. And at that time, we were upwards of 15, 20 complaints in any given week of drug use and problems in that area. So once we're out on the street, we start looking at what trends we have, specific complaints from the neighborhood, houses that we know of, hotel rooms that we know of, that we've been uh, gotten information about that are actively selling illicit narcotics at the same time in our covert work we will use informants and a lot of people in the community either trying to get rid of a charge 
or we do have a lot of performance that are actually just people that want to help mm-hmm. and are not looking for any remuneration or they're not looking for any kind of payback. They just have that info and they want to see their community a little cleaner, a little better, and not have a lot of the crime spikes we have that relate to substance use. And then from there, we could really go anywhere. We'll have days that are kind of, hey, we didn't really find anything and we're knocking off right at 5 p.m. And we have other days where we were sitting there at 3 o'clock in the morning going, how the heck did we get here? And we just wrote two, three search warrants on vehicles and houses. And all of a sudden, we're pulling 10, 15 rifles out of someone's house wow. uh, along with uh, large amounts of narcotics. So, And it, of course, connects to everything else. So there's a lot of communication between us and the narcotics unit and our burglary investigations people and our assaults people. And narcotics, as much as we look at it as, generally speaking, a quote-unquote victimless crime, the use of the drug is not the big issue that we're looking at. Uh, and that's, that's the social end of this. Uh, in terms of the law enforcement end, when the user who cannot get what they need, starts breaking into cars or robbing people or stealing to get what they need, that's when we start really having the problems. And that's where a unit like mine gets to really affect the uh, overall crime statistics and the overall safety in our community. That's where the victims tend to come in, at least from our perspective where we're standing and from what we understand, the majority of the community who, who makes the laws that we that we enforce. So, mm-hmm. and that's, that's kind of our day-to-day. And I know that was a really long answer to a pretty simple question, but that's that's uh, that's what we're doing every day. And that was our pre-COVID. We didn't have the big issues. The major issue we were dealing with was changes in the drug laws and how we charge that and the logistics that go with it. Did that so? And that change, that four gram rule change, was pre-COVID. It was. It was March 1st. March 1st. (laughs) That's when everything changed for us. And we spent uh, everything from June of last year, June of 19, to March 1 this year, really getting ourselves prepared, ourselves prepared, and kind of redefining how we do what we do uh, in my unit. Also educating a lot of our uniformed components because all of a sudden they're going to have to deal with this and file their paperwork differently. And I, the bigger issue was the logistics in it. There wasn't really any huge pushback about it should still be a felony or that's not, I mean, we can comment on it based on opinion as much as we want, but we, we understand and uh, we respect the fact that we don't make the law and we don't make the ultimate decision with the law. All we do is enforce it. We don't sit there and decide who's guilty. And yeah. We don't say who goes to jail. Hey, I, I wonder, I first read about a program in Seattle that I think Denver, mm-hmm. the LEAD program, the Law Enforcement Correct. Assisted Diversion. Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. How did that play into your pre-COVID experience with all this? The LEAD was a very interesting one. It was presented to us, and that one I will honestly say there was quite a bit of pushback. And you know, before we go on, could you explain to our listeners who might not oh, be absolutely. familiar with that program what it was and is? And, and is, yes. So Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, the LEAD program, the acronym for LEAD. So it's basically what, what we challenged ourselves to do, really, was partner with the Mental Health Center of Denver and clinicians that they have there who are on standby. When we find ourselves contacting an individual that would formerly have gone to jail for possession of a controlled substance, uh, be it a small amount of heroin. But we're talking about user amounts yep. of uh, narcotics. No other charges connected to them. They don't have outstanding warrants from another city. And we didn't contact them because they were assaulting someone. We contacted them on a consensual contact and through the process found out, oh, wait, this person has drugs. Or we contacted them. We saw them using drugs in possession of those drugs. So they could have or the potential is there and their discretion is still there for the officer to send that person to jail. We started looking at it as as a department, specifically with a lot of leadership from our now chief at the time he was a District 1 commander, Paul Pazin. He had even gone to Seattle and looked at their program. Seattle was the biggest. I believe Albany also was one of the founders of this kind of concept. So what will happen is that individual, rather than going to jail, will be connected immediately with a mental health clinician who responds to the scene 
and starts the process of getting this person to treatment rather than getting this person in jail. And I think this really does go back to what I said earlier about treating the symptoms versus treating the actual disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a very positive step for law enforcement in terms of getting the disease treated and getting those individuals the help that they need, especially when they want that help. I've said this many, many times over the years, uh, tens of thousands of times, I've given what I call the speech, and I know just about every cop in the in the country has probably given the same speech, and it's the speech that starts with, hey, you have a problem, and it ends with, if you want help, let me know, because we will help. 14 years, I've had two people call me back, and for those two people, I'll give the speech 10,000 more times. I mean, it's for those two people, it's absolutely worth it. Mm-hmm. So this was a real big push. Lead was a big push to have an established body that was ready to respond at a moment's notice when we found that individual who was saying, yes, I want help. Just a couple of qu- just points of clarification. When you say respond to the scene, does that mean that you can have that counselor literally show up? Or Absolutely. D- wow. Absolutely. So I'm going to get to some of the the speed bumps that we got to in this program as well. And we're still dealing with quite a few speed bumps. But in theory, when the officer calls and says, hey, I have this person sitting here and they are asking for help. They have a little bit of heroin in a syringe. They used half of it and the rest is here. They were going to use it later. I could put them in jail for this. But what is that going to solve? I can actually have better effect on the community if I call our clinician. So the hotline is called. Once that hotline is called, the clinician will take very basic information about the individual, basically a name and a way to contact them and a way to contact us and then say, where are you? And I'll see you in a few minutes. Wow. So the clinician responds to the scene and we call this a uh, warm handoff and we hand off that individual, especially easier now that we have already affected all the law enforcement stuff. The, the, we have made sure that there are no weapons on the person. We know that the person's calm, that they're asking for help. This doesn't work when the person is uh, potentially coming down from a drug, aggressive. Uh, if they're armed, obviously, this isn't going to work. But it works really, really well when the individual's asked for help, our clinician responds, and takes over from there. Mm-hmm. What's tough for us in the law enforcement end of things is we tend to like to follow up with things. So the first time I did this, we handed off to a clinician who I'm still in contact with, and, and uh, she's awesome. Mental Health Center in Denver is just filled with really, really great people. And I handed off to, the, to our clinician, and she said, okay, I've got it from here. And two days later, I, I followed up with our clinician, and our clinician said, hey, that's private. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get to know. Uh-huh. And I'm sitting there saying, wait, all my cases that I sent to the DA's office, I know what happens with those. The unfortunate reality is we don't get to know, and, and that's uh, only unfortunate to us. And it's only because we care and we want to follow up. But just that knowledge that the individual is getting some help, at least the springboard towards help, Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's something, and it's something more than what we were doing. Because what we were doing for years and years, decades, <laughs> uh, it, it it's not working. Yeah, and that's, that's prevalent. Do you have any any idea of how many times that system has been used or enacted, or how effective it's been? I, I don't know the exact numbers. I should say that. I do know that we have had quite a few missteps mostly on the communication end and and that's kind of kind of something to be expected with any pilot program especially when the pilot program crosses over uh not only different parts of not only our department but our our city agencies but also private agencies like mental health center of denver who are connected to us but are still privately funded and they're not a city entity. So the, the cross communication between agencies really got a little muddy for a while. Funding was an issue as well. And it wasn't that people didn't want to fund it. It was a matter of having a central individual or a central office that really ran things. So we're still working through it. Mm-hmm. The program is still there. I don't know how many times it's been used. I know that every time it was used and everything lined up correctly, that there was a successful warm handoff between Denver police officers and the mental health clinicians. Mm -hmm. So 
That much I know. I know also know there were a lot of times where phone calls were made, there was no answer, okay, this isn't working, that type of thing. There were issues on the Denver Police Department end when it came to how the paperwork gets completed. Again, these are all logistic issues, and I think it's a uh, program that's really worth pushing forward and continuing to fund, and I, I think it's a huge part of what we should be doing as law enforcement officers on a daily basis uh, in terms of supporting and helping out our community. Yeah, I think it's an important, really important topic and might be interesting to circle back with you at a future time just to see how that's going, because I do think it is such a key, key change we can make in the entire approach to substance use disorder Absolutely. management. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would love to get back with you about that in, in years and months to come. How did COVID change your typical day? Well, we all had to wear masks and that wasn't fun. <laughs> uh, no, uh, other than that, yeah, <laughs> our world went upside down. Yeah. Um, where we usually were very heavily connected to the district attorney's office and had to kind of mirror our hours mm -hmm. to theirs. All of a sudden, we were dealing with new problems that we had never really seen before. We've always had business burglaries at night. All of a sudden, our business burglaries, our overnight business burglaries, went up more than 600% in the city and county. And the quick fix to that was we have plain clothes undercover guys that we can put out there so our hours which were nine to five at least technically nine to five mm -hmm. on paper we're here a lot longer and they shift a lot but all of a sudden we were working overnights and we were dealing with the same the same people uh we're dealing with drug users and drug dealers but now we're dealing with them in a different capacity uh we're finding people breaking the houses and then violent crime went through the roof within a couple weeks the big movers of illicit narcotics in denver were really showing themselves as being a lot of our local street gangs and when the street gangs are really becoming public about that it's an organized crime movement so it became very connected to violent crime narcotics became very connected to our property crimes in denver we're seeing hundred upon hundred percent increases in these things and uh the way our tactics had to change in terms of as a department and as a unit in terms of how we were going to deal with these problems so our hours changed all of a sudden we were dealing with a lot less people and everyone could see us coming because there was no way to blend into a crowd there's no way to blend yeah. in with traffic because there was no traffic and there was no crowds. So being able to really enforce our, our drug laws, being able to enforce all of our laws, because as a narcotic, even though we're a narcotics team, we, we're not going to drive by someone breaking the law because it's not narcotics. Right. <laughs> we're going to stop and we're going to, uh, we're going to keep people safe. We're going to take care of the business we have to take care of. And in this situation, it became very difficult to do so. We had to change tactics. We became much more reliant on some of our technological features, such as placing rapid deployment cameras in areas that were getting hit the hardest. We were arresting quite a few burglars, and what we noticed, as we did in the daytime with the business burglaries, what we really began to notice was all of our burglars were also in possession of either some kind of narcotic or uh, some kind of drug use paraphernalia. So as I said earlier, we're, we're constantly crossing over between our, our drug crimes and our property slash violent crime. Oh, so wait, I have to pause you here yes. for a second because oh, I'm absorbing. I appreciate you doing it. I'll keep talking. To you. <laughs> I'm just absorbing this information. So just correct me. A 600%, so a sevenfold increase in a small business or business burglaries at night. Yes, and it, all it was over over six hundred. I don't have the exact number, but last I was told, we were at six hundred plus percent overnight business burglaries in Denver. And point two, I picked up there was that you just said, I believe that pretty much all of the burglars who are apprehended had evidence that these are property crimes that are designed to fund a drug habit. Am I reading? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Either to fund a drug habit or to otherwise support that drug habit. Uh, when it comes to burglaries and theft from motor vehicle, which is also a, went very, very high. So basically people breaking into cars, stealing things from those cars, those sorts of crimes in my experience, we generally see a connection to 
narcotics use. But wh- okay, so now what I'm stuck on is why suddenly? It could not be that there were suddenly six times the number of people using. Is this a moment of opportunity or is this drug users losing their jobs? Can you no, explain? I, 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 will, I will say that from what I saw, the bulk of the arrestees, the users, burglars, and those involved in violent crimes, particularly street robberies, that sort of thing, seeking something of value that they can use to uh, buy drugs. I will say that most of these individuals are part of our homeless community. And uh, considering the homeless community really did not, especially at the beginning of COVID, have a place to go. They did not have a legitimate place to quarantine themselves. Mm -hmm. They were the only people that were out at three, four o'clock in the morning. And they were the only people that were breaking into anything at three or four o'clock in the morning. Hmm. You know, and, and again, I'm not trying to paint this with a broad brush when I say they're the only, uh, subjecting myself to a little bit of hyperbole there. <laughs> yeah. Of course, there were other people, and I'm, I'm not trying to pigeonhole. What I am saying, however, is the overwhelming majority of these individuals were part of our homeless population. And before we really got our National Western and the stock show set up as a homeless respite with some amount of social distancing, they really had nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. And big concern was with COVID, how quickly is this going to spread through our homeless population? Mm -hmm. And I would imagine 30, 40 years ago, we would have had a different response. But in this day and age, we do see this in Denver in particular, as in my conversations with our command and our standpoint as police officers, they are one of the most vulnerable, if not the most vulnerable population in Denver to crime, to, to disease, to social harms like substance use and a lot of cases, that's what got them there. In other cases, it's their, you know, it's uh, a, a way of self-medicating. So we, we understand that now. We see that, and it was a very big problem. And since starting some of our shelters and enforcing a lot of the overnight stuff, we've seen our burglary numbers go down. We've seen violent crime hold pretty steady, but hopefully we'll see that on a downward swing. But these were all elements that the homeless population was very tied into. And since they were taken care of lastly, mostly because most of the homeless population doesn't have that ability to take care of themselves, they really kind of got the short end of the stick on COVID because there were a lot of arrests and they were the only ones out there. Yeah. We weren't targeting them. It was just that that, that was the crime. And we catch people committing a crime, we don't really have too much of a choice. Yeah. I can imagine at the same time that it must be really frustrating or that there might be times that you feel that police are being asked to do just everything from, you know, managing addiction to homelessness to untreated mental illness to youth violence. It's just, it's a tall order what you're being asked it is. to do. Uh, so I spoke a little bit earlier about how we evolve as police officers and as a law enforcement agency and as a law enforcement community nationwide. Let's face it, look at the elephant in the room. We're looking at major change right now, and especially in the current climate and considering what we saw just recently in Minneapolis, uh, most police officers, if not almost every police officer I've spoken to that has seen uh, the video of George Floyd is sitting there saying, oh my goodness, this is not us. Mm -hmm. This is not what we stand for. This is what we do. I could never be that person. And how dare he put on a badge? (laughs) This this is how we feel across the board. We understand what our community is saying to us and we're listening. That's part of our community. That's, that's what we do. Every time we do anything, we put it on paper and we evaluate what we've done and see how we can do it better, whether we're being pressured to do so or not. So there is always that, that evolution element in law enforcement. We do take on the role of law enforcers, of warriors, as well as guardians, as well as social workers and priests and confidants. And my girlfriend gets really, she doesn't get angry, but I don't know if she likes it when I have some person from the street call me at three o'clock in the morning and say, hey, you gave me your business card and I need help. But she understands it. (laughs) and She appreciates that I do it. And Every cop I know out there, I know in this district and most of the cops in Denver are doing the same thing I am. And we're not looking for accolades. We're just evolving with this and we're taking those steps towards being as complete a civil servant as we can possibly be. Yeah. And I would also imagine that that makes for a much more satisfying career than playing a game of whack-a-mole of putting people in jail. Yeah, absolutely. We're not looking to arrest the problem. Yeah. We can't arrest a community problem. We can make arrests, and, and uh, we, we do. We, we don't have issues with 
arresting people when when it's necessary. That's part of the job. There's a lot of satisfaction I get as well if I put handcuffs onto a homicide suspect, a sex assault on a child suspect. I'm not judging them. I'm not doing it harshly, but yes, there's a satisfaction to knowing that at least right now, this community is safe. That child is safe for the moment. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of, of satisfaction in that. At the same time, there's nothing fun about having to take a person that's homeless and needs help taking them to jail because they've got an out-of-county warrant and I don't have a choice. It's an order from a judge in Adams County, let's say, for a very minor crime, but that's that's his job. And that's a really easy one. I wonder in the worst of COVID weeks, were you able to take people to jail? I've heard stories of jails just saying, sorry, can't take this (laughs) felon with an outstanding warrant. Right. I'm I'm very happy you brought that up. That was a huge issue for us, and it's an ongoing issue. The jail, like any other area, any other enclosed space, has to really concern themselves with the spread of the disease. So most counties in the metro said, you know what, unless it's a violent felony warrant, we are going to say, let him walk Mm -hmm. or her. And we will deal with it when we have better resources to to deal with the problem. In most cases, these were lower level crimes, uh, still problem crimes. Not nothing. I'm not going to say that these crimes were not important. They absolutely were. But if we brought a murderer, someone that's accused of murdering someone, alleged murderer, mm-hmm. to jail, they weren't going to turn that individual away. We were going to take that warrant. But on the smaller stuff, it really was a matter of not only keeping our deputies safe in the sheriff's department that work in the jail every day, but keeping our, our prison population and our jail population safe. Yeah, uh, We firmly live by that idea that once we have custody of the individual, they are our responsibility. And, and not just their safety getting from point A to point B, but their health is our responsibility, which is why department, the city, and, and the taxpayers pay an exorbitant amount of money just in, in terms of medically treating individuals that are in jail or are going to jail and are in our custody. That's on us. <laughs> We're making yeah. that decision, and I think it's an important one, but we really have to keep everybody safe on that one. Yeah. Made it very difficult out in the street because we were arresting people for the same crime within five or six hours wow. of having arrested them previously. So in, in those weeks, and even now, I suppose, people who you apprehended for higher level narcotics crimes, drug dealers, mm-hmm. did they go to jail or were they let go? Uh, they Most of them went to jail, but it was for a very limited amount of time, enough time to process the individual. For some of the crime, even for higher level crimes, for example, possession of a controlled substance with the intent to distribute that substance and the aggravator that the individual is a felon and had a firearm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now we've got these aggravating factors. Now let's throw in that it was within a thousand feet of a playground. So now we have a drug free zone on top of that. So we have numerous aggravators, an individual that we observed dealing to other individuals. That person will likely be in jail where it would have been three days and arraignment. And then we'd see a bond placed on the person during the COVID months, especially when it was uh, March, April, we'd see that person go into jail and it would be a matter of 10, 12 hours until morning to get arraigned because they would have to see a judge. But other than that, they would still get that PR bond, a personal recognizance bond, and then be out on the street again. We generally take a little bit of an issue with that, mostly because of the presence of a firearm. Once an individual is out there dealing drugs and they're telling the community by having a firearm that they are willing to hurt someone to protect that business, yeah, uh, that that we, we take exception to that. Yeah, big time. <laughs> I can I can see why. Yeah. Yes, curious too about you know the whole world has seen disruptions to supply chains. Yes, how have the disruptions or have there been disruptions in supply chains of heroin, fentanyl, meth, everything? Been really interesting, I have to say. I cocaine. Let's start there. Um, we have had a huge increase in the price of cocaine, but we have not had an interruption in the supply. But I, I got information from a uh, an individual I know to be a drug dealer, specifically a cocaine dealer, and the individual said that everything is through the roof. He's got plenty of supply, but with people staying home, 
his demand has gone through the roof. So the dealers have been able to raise cocaine prices and still have that same supply coming in and the flow coming in while being able to raise prices and, and boost their business on the back end. Mostly in my research, most of what I found is that uh, cocaine tends to come to the U.S. and to Europe over uh, water routes. So it's coming in cargo, that sort of thing. Water routes and overseas trade has not been affected to the same degree that air cargo and ground cargo has. So when we start looking at our drugs that tend to come in by air, such as methamphetamine, the price has more than doubled and the supply has gone down to nothing. Hmm. So uh, that's been a huge one. Heroin, we've actually been seeing the price go up. My understanding is supply has gone down. However, our recoveries of heroin have gone up. Typically, heroin seizures tend to be fairly small, especially for a team like ours. We are a street narcotic team, so we specifically focus on the street trade. Once we start getting into major distributors, cartel stuff, that type of thing, that gets handed off to units with greater resources than we have. It's not something that we're going to look at as a long-term project. Uh, I don't have the resources to do it. I've got mm-hmm. five guys. So, uh-huh. um, so we're not going to follow up on that, on that kind of thing. With heroin, though, we've got such a huge supply of fentanyl either in the U.S. or somewhere south of the border, because about a year, year and a half ago, with the popularity of fentanyl increasing, we started seeing heroin, particularly black tar heroin, which 95% of what we get in Colorado is black tar heroin. Mm -hmm. We were starting to see it all come back as more than 90% fentanyl as opposed to heroin. So Uh, the black tar you were seizing, you analyzed, and it's 95% fentanyl? 95% of what we were seeing come in was more fentanyl than heroin. Wow. So the amount of fentanyl in the heroin, and we we all know in the production of heroin or methamphetamine or any other illicit drug that they're not making in a controlled lab, the additives are, you, you can... Throw a, throw a dart at a dartboard and figure out what the additives are because yeah. it's, it's going to be anything you can think of. From my research and people I've spoken to out on the street, uh, fentanyl was introduced into a lot of the heroin a few years ago, mostly as a boost to get people, a couple people to overdose, which in turn would make the uh, rest of the user population turn around and say, hey, that must be really good. He just couldn't handle it. And it doesn't make any logical sense to me but uh, I don't think it makes logical sense to most people but within the uh, the drug use community it made a lot of sense especially when you're looking for a better high every time so they really people started seeking the heroin that had fentanyl in it and really brought us to this point where now we've got fentanyl pills that look like oxycodone the mm-hmm. M30 blue pills. Yeah. Uh, we started seeing them at the end of last year. We saw during COVID, that was pretty much what you could get. So we had in our department, it wasn't my team, but we had seizures in central Denver, not too far from downtown. Uh, I think they got 75,000 fentanyl pills that were made to look like, uh, like, like Oxycontin. Uh, like, like Oxycontin. Yeah. And it was two weeks ago. Wow. The, the, the amount of fentanyl that's out there is just, it's through the roof uh, to the degree that we're finding it in everything else. In terms of the land routes, I know that it really stifled a lot of narcotics coming up from over the border. That's why methamphetamine is so, so expensive right now and so hard to find. So we do find a lot of people going to other drugs just to uh, to get some kind of fix, to really get themselves going. And we see a lot of mixing drugs that we have not seen in the past. Heroin, cocaine, the, that was always, a, I mean, going back to the 60s and 70s, that was a, a big deal. Yeah. But we started really seeing mixes of fentanyl and everything, fentanyl and meth, fentanyl and heroin. We started seeing uh, mixtures of methamphetamine and heroin. And I think that has to do with the fact that heroin, as much as the supply has been stifled, we're, we're still seeing quite a bit of it, whereas we're not seeing as much meth the past couple months. So people have been boosting their meth supply with heroin from what we see. And when you do seize drugs on from the street, how often do you test their content? Is that a routine procedure or what's the protocol? It, for? Until March 1st, it was absolutely routine. 
so that was one of the big changes that we saw with the change to our uh, Uniform Control Substances Act. We would, when it was a felony charge, every arrest, when the property that went into into evidence, the evidence that went to our property bureau, drugs, would be picked up at some point within the next day or so by our chemists from the Denver Crime Laboratory, which is right across from our headquarters. Mm-hmm. So they would come across, grab the drugs, bring them to their lab, and in that controlled su- setting, they test them. And they would report back to us what the findings were, whether it was controlled or if it was presumptively not controlled. And that would give us where we would go as a next step in charging the individual or what the DA was going to take, uh, where the DA was going to take the case. With the introduction of under four grams being a misdemeanor. Ah, you don't test. Right. Uh Uh-huh. So now what we do is, and this also ties in with our, our reduction of social harms, we do arrest the individual and we bring them into jail and we connect those individuals in jail with clinicians that are in the jail itself. So if a person comes in, they're a drug user, they have under four grams, this would be an M1, a misdemeanor one, level one mis- drug misdemeanor charge. Mm-hmm. They have the option right away of saying, hey, we'll just get rid of this case as long as you at least start some kind of treatment right now today. Mm -hmm. So the person does not necessarily have to finish a huge program, but the person does have to sit down with the clinician and say, okay, what are we dealing with today? Where are you in your addiction? Are you just starting out? Are you a high school kid that tried it for the first time? Have you been embedded in drug use for the past 30 years and your veins have collapsed and you know where, where are you in your substance use journey and let's determine that and see what we can do and, and the next step we can take in that situation there's no reason for us to test the drugs because we're just going to destroy them anyway we're not going to charge the individual in in court we're actually going to make their charges go away yeah because they're taking steps towards fixing the problem even if it's just one step. And even with no longer testing those small quantities, do you still feel like you're testing enough to know about these shifts in content? I do mostly because the stuff we do test is generally speaking the dealer's supply. Yeah. So So it's the same stuff. Yeah. Right. So it's either going to be a quantity, a larger quantity, four grams or up. Um, Usually... We're talking about an ounce, a half ounce, that type of thing. And when we're talking about dealers, this is what's going to go out into the street. Yeah. So this is what's going to turn into the four grams or under four grams later on. Yeah. So I think we've got a good bead on that. I also think that considering this is March, April, May, June, we're less than three months into this. I think we've got a really good bead on where we stand with what's coming in. And the arrests really show us... Uh, in terms of what's tested and everything, the arrests are what's showing us what's happening during COVID in terms of individual, not necessarily purity or that that's more based on six months to a year of testing stuff. I think uh, the testing end of things is really yet to be seen since we're so early in this. Just curious, I'm still stuck on the amount of fentanyl in what you're taking off the streets. Is that a change from a year ago, two years ago? It's a huge change. It's a huge change. Yes. Let's say a year and a half to two years ago, if we found fentanyl, it was a major, major deal. Yeah. We still didn't know quite what we were dealing with with fentanyl. We had a lot of warnings on the front end, particularly about fentanyl that was finely ground and could be almost an aerosol and could be taken in into the uh, respiratory system and affect police officers very rapidly. Yeah. The fentanyl we have found, with the exception of once, we actually found that pharmaceutical grade, fine, super powdered stuff once in a lab where they were synthesizing some heroin with fentanyl. We mm-hmm. also found it in a pill pressing operation where they were making fentanyl pills. But for the most part, what we have found has already been processed. You can touch it if it's if the smoke's in the air, you might. We, we have had a few officers that have been exposed to fentanyl smoke, but we've also had officers exposed to methamphetamine smoke, cocaine, uh, the whole nine yards. Uh, yeah. If when we're around it, unfortunately, the exposure risk is huge. But we started understanding more about 
fentanyl and, and uh, how it's synthesized, how it's synthesized into different drugs and the process. We never anticipated seeing what on the street is being called Mexican Oxy, which is the M30 fentanyl pills. Mm -hmm. We and we really noticed it when uh, college kids, what a college kid, I believe he was up here at Regis University, uh, overdosed on an M30 pill. Mm -hmm. And he had been using different kinds of oxy and perks and Vicodin and that type of thing recreationally, but he didn't know what he was getting. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. I've gotten a lot of calls related to that. My unit right now has in the past and continues to work criminally negligent homicides where drug dealers have sold to users uh, saying it's one thing when it's something else. And recent legislation, past few years, has given us the ability to go after those drug dealers and charge them with that homicide. And I think it's appropriate. Yeah, I think There's a lot of different points of view on that one. Yeah. I, I accept all of those points of view. But in my, in my, for my shoes, where I'm standing in this chair, yes, my shoes standing chair. <laughs> Uh, from, from my vantage point, uh, I think it's absolutely appropriate. If you're going to poison our community and if someone dies because of it, I do think you should be charged with a homicide. Yeah. I believe that fatal overdoses involving an opioid went down negligibly in 2018. With all this fentanyl, I would expect increases in overdose. Do you have an idea of where... I don't What's have happening? an idea. Yeah. I do know that I have responded to a lot of overdose calls and have gotten a lot of citizen complaints about family members who have overdosed. And three years ago, 2016, 2017, I'd say I get two or three calls like that a year. 2018, about the same. Last year, I will say I was getting two or three, maybe four calls a month rather than in a year. Uh -huh. on problems connected to overdoses, whether the individual overdosed and died or the individual was Narcaned and brought back or they survived the overdose. I was getting a lot of community complaints from users, recreational users, long-term users saying, hey, I've been buying drugs from someone for a long time and I never had a problem and then I overdosed and something was really wrong with this stuff and now my friends are all overdosing. Oh, so, that, that's fascinating. So people using these drugs would call you to lodge absolutely. a complaint. Interesting. Do you uh, follow up on those and contact the dealer? Well, I, would, and... I would always follow mm -hmm. up. Would, would I always get to make contact with the individual that sold them? No. A lot of times they, they, we weren't even able to identify the person other than you know, he calls himself you know, Brooklyn and, uh, and he's got long hair. I don't know him. <laughs> but but I'm also I also think back to your remarks about a few moments ago that this is a marketing ploy that if you have a few people who overdose, that signals to the community that this is good stuff. Right, and I think the dealers themselves even went overboard with that, and now they they start losing population. It doesn't make any sense to me yeah. to uh, negate the people that are buying your product. <laughs> yeah it really doesn't but, if you uh, kill all your customers that's a business model right, flaw exactly. yeah exactly this is this is really good but there's a very good chance that it's going to kill you the only yeah. thing that this is working for is the drug dealers here in denver and uh, the tobacco industry uh, yeah <laughs> so, yeah uh, but it is it's a similar concept as i see it why would you kill off the people that are paying you yeah it doesn't make sense do you have a sense of how many people who use drugs know that there's fentanyl in their heroin? Is that common knowledge? At this stage of the game, it is. It is, uh, yeah. When we contact people and ask if they, hey, do you have anything you're not supposed to have on you? Usually, the people that have the M30 blue pills say, yes, I have a bunch of fentanyl pills. Uh-huh. So they call them fentanyl pills. They ask for them as such. Interesting. And yeah. if they actually get a for real M30 blue pill, they will be very, very angry. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a disappointment. Wow. It is. Yeah. Because now, now it's the expectation is that an M30 pill is fentanyl. Is fentanyl. And you can smoke that off of a piece of foil and it'll make for a good time for that individual. Yeah. That's what they're looking for now. Yeah. I guess one small, maybe slim silver lining here is that methamphetamine is, is way more expensive. Just given how much harder lift it is to treat methamphetamine use disorder than opioid use disorder. 
I would have thought that there would be some local production of methamphetamine. Is it just that the precursors are just not available anymore? So difficult to get those precursors, especially the pseudoephedrine or ephedrine, depending on how you're synthesizing. Just based on the laws that we've put in place now and the fact that we can't buy pseudoephedrine in yeah. more than two packages yeah. without an ID and being over 21. So yeah. those elements have really made it so difficult to make methamphetamine locally. When I started on this job in 2006, my second month on the street, I ran into three different meth labs in Southwest Denver. Now that I'm a narcotics supervisor in four and a half years, I have ran into one very small scale methamphetamine lab. Most of methamphetamine production now is a locally at least is what, what we call shake and bake it's mm -hmm. usually in the soda bottle and having the reaction occur really isolated um, the danger is a lot lower we don't get the explosions because it's just less material so the explosions happen they just they yeah. don't happen it's and then take down the whole house yeah type of thing. they're tiny um, tiny explosions. exactly yeah. they're more much more contained but they produce much, much less. Yeah. And, and they're very, very difficult, very time consuming. And the process is, it's chemistry. It's very specific. Uh, so yeah. uh, they, they're not always successful. The, the individuals that, that uh, put this together are not always successful and they don't always try. So with the advent of legalization of marijuana in, in Colorado and a lot of other places across the country, production of methamphetamine in, in Mexico really went through the roof. And they can do it really cheap. They can do it almost legally because the precursors are not... Uh, they're able to get a hold of the precursors. It's just a matter of getting it over the border. Yeah. So that's that's the big holdup. Uh, I'm only assuming that there is, are large quantities of methamphetamine in uh, in locations right over the border that's just waiting to come over. Yeah. So I, I do anticipate as our borders open up, we're going to see an influx of meth. And I think I like the silver lining right now. I'm worried about what we have to come. It's not going to last. Yeah. Curious to know also about your perspective on, or if you've heard anything about Suboxone on the street. Is, is there any, maybe I'm naively, wishfully thinking that there's a way for people to sort of self-treat their opioid use disorder. Is Suboxone available? It is. Uh, it's available through quite a, a number of different treatment facilities, outpatient and inpatient. And we do see it on the street as well. We see uh, we see it used fairly often as a bartering item. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it's a bartering item for heroin or for fentanyl or for another opioid. But we're seeing quite a bit of it. So people diverting their Suboxone to trade for or, or barter for heroin or fentanyl? Uh, it's similar to, similarly as they would with methadone previously and, and that sort of thing. It's Yes, they, that's not a new thing. Yeah. It's been going on for a long, long time. So my naive thought that people are treating themselves with daily doses is not something you're seeing. I'm sure that there are many, many people that are legitimately yeah. treating themselves and looking for that help. Um, as, as you know, as well as I do, uh, it's a very very difficult road to take on your own yeah and i would not suggest that to anyone yes the boxing i hope is uh, a huge uh, substitute that is going to help that individual but i'd rather have the individual say yes i'm using suboxone and i'm getting help and i have someone that's out there that's looking out for me yeah we were speaking with an addiction doc yesterday talking about the temporary changes to dea regulations on take-home methadone have you been seeing any effects of that? Are you seeing more methadone being diverted or methadone overdoses? No. No. No, I'm not. Um, I have not seen a methadone overdose in quite a while that I am aware of. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I've seen overdoses that I've assumed were one drug but ended up being another in the long run. But I've not seen any. No, I haven't seen any good. that were specifically methadone based. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Are there other impacts of COVID on your work? Anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, we were put in a, a tough spot with COVID. You know, everybody went home and we went on to 12, 15 hour shifts. So it was the reverse for 
for law enforcement. And, and it was very, it was tough, particularly dealing with the populations we deal with overnight. Protecting ourselves was an issue. This isn't looked at enough, I think, with anything law enforcement related. We choose to do this job and we absolutely make that choice. Our families don't make that choice. They're stuck with us. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the big concern for most of us was how do we take care of our community which is infected with a pandemic and not take that pandemic home to a quarantined family. Yeah. That was a challenge. It was a huge challenge. And I know a lot of us, when we sneezed or coughed or, or uh, couldn't breathe all of a sudden for a little short of breath, we were also attuned to all of these symptoms that there were times that we said, you know what? I'm not going to go home. Yeah. I'm going to spend the next couple of days in my office. I caught up on paperwork, <laughs> but my family didn't get sick. And once I was relatively sure that I wasn't infected, then I get to see my, my kids again. Uh, it, it was, that was really, really tough. So you, uh, so you sem- sort of self quarantined from your family in your office. Oh, absolutely. Do you have a uh, mattress? Nice... Did you sleep for those days? Or? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. We, we found a way. We uh-huh. found a way. Wow. Um, we, um, when we have most guys, we're coming in with a, a bag so they can shower right away uh, before they left the station. Mm-hmm. Um, then, of course, within the police station, we started to have to socially distance as well. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't have more than two people in the locker room at the same time. So showers became tough. Gym use became tough. And uh, our physical health uh, is hugely important. You're too many out of shape cops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, the, those, the, the, what we took home was a big struggle. On the street, uh, it was really a matter of being community police officers helping our community with just the day-to-day stuff like getting to the supermarket and kind of being a good example wearing our masks socially distancing ourselves answering the questions as they came up we really uh, we felt good for a while there yeah <laughs> we felt appreciated during covid or at least the first end of it and now now of course we're dealing with a little bit of psychological whiplash on our end but that's kind of yeah. the nature of the beast in law enforcement yeah well although this seems like a particularly uh, it's. Yes. I, I hope that in your career there will never be a harder year than this I, one. I hope. I hope in our country. Yeah. There, there'll never be a harder year because it's. We're halfway through and this has been a tough one. I think it's been a tough one across the board. Yeah, for sure. Well, listen. I so appreciate your time and your insights and just hearing about the last few months. And we'd love to have you back on the show if you're again willing to come back. And because I feel like I have. 20 more questions I want to ask you, <laughs> but I also want to respect that you have a lot of demands on your time right now. We do. And I will say, though, Elizabeth, this is uh, this is an important conversation. And more than likely, those 20 questions that you still have are also important conversations. These are conversations we need to have. And if I can make myself available to you, to everyone that's going to be listening to this and to the people in our community, I'm more than happy to do so. I'm obliged to do so. I, I, uh, I'm here to help. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would love to have you <laughs> have you back on and just because, you know, among like the criminalization of, of substance use disorders, this is a huge question of how we go forward as a, as a nation in, in dealing with substance use disorders and your perspective on it like is key you know yeah, i wanted no. to ask you like because whatever you talk about seattle you know you gotta ask about portugal and sort of other countries and right. um and that would be a whole nother hour if you're up for it at some point oh i i'm definitely up for it i think it's a uh, very positive stuff uh, i've this is kind of new for me i recently started a uh teaching well not teaching but kind of instructing a, a half-day class uh, on drug identification and drug dangers for social workers. Mm. So um, that, that's that been a huge, huge success. I've done it twice now. And I just keep getting great feedback about, hey, when can you come back? There are more people that want to take the class. Uh, start, it really started dawning on me that uh, our social workers, especially our field social workers in Denver, they go to people's houses and they're exposed to so many things that they don't know or yeah. understand. Yeah. Um, and they have a really uh, a great insight 
into the individual. And if they start seeing some of the telltale signs of substance use disorder, particularly when it comes to paraphernalia around the house, uh, uh, stuff that's happening with the kids, stuff that's happening with uh, adolescents as they come in through and get exposed to more uh, drugs and everything. It's, it's just, they can help so much. Yeah. They know what they're looking at. Yeah. And, and, and it really was about, it wasn't about, hey, we need your help and we're going to put people in jail. It's about, hey, don't tell us. We don't need to know. <laughs> this is your job and we want to make you more effective at helping people. We've got the same job. We just got different ways of getting from point A to point B. Yeah. I, I think also for physicians, uh, EMTs, paramedics, you know, everybody, particularly for physicians, I feel like. You know, we ha physicians latch onto opioid use disorder mm -hmm. partly because it has such a neat pathophysiology and it's treatable with methadone or buprenorphine and it just seems right. sort of easy. But I think the impression I'm getting about the world is that people who have, you know, over severe substance use disorders, it almost doesn't matter. Like, they're, it's okay you, you, if there's no meth, you shift to cocaine or whatever's cheap. Right. And... It's not neat, and this is the opioid epidemic is not something that we're going to solve with better access to methadone. Like I there agree. are deeper, there are way deeper societal problems here. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's one of the things that I really I, I appreciated when the everything got changed with the DSM five, and it became substance use disorder. I, I thought that was just really appropriate because. I, I absolutely understand where, where our doctors are coming from and our insurance companies are coming from. But in terms of really looking at the disorder, it's almost an addiction to addiction. Yeah. And it's the consequence, again, don't get me going, but it's the consequence yeah. of a society where, you know, a quarter of kids will be physically, emotionally or sexually abused. I mean, this is this is not... You know, because a lot of the work I'm doing is writing guidelines to limit opioid prescription after your, you know, your hysterectomy. And right. it's just such a limited view of how people develop addictions mm -hmm. um, and just fascinating stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are the best. This was really wonderful. I so, so good. appreciate it. I just hope it does some good. Thank it, you. It will. <laughs> Thanks so Bye. much. Thank you.